Hi, and welcome to K-Pod, the podcast about Korean Americans and arts and culture from Korean American Story. I'm Katherine Hong, a writer and editor. And I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. And we thought we'd do a different sort of episode this time to introduce our new season, which is season five. So we usually mainly focused on individuals who really work in art. And I think during our interviews with uh, our guests, we've noticed that there are certain common threads or um, just things that have really piqued our curiosity. And that has a lot to do with our shared culture and the stories around the culture of Korean Americans. And so we decided that we were going to do a whole season based on uh, cultural topics, where it's less about individual stories, but about the traditions and uh, cultural themes that we grew up with and how they've changed. Right. So we thought we'd do an episode just to explain how we're going to shake it up a little bit this season. So a few of the topics that we plan to discuss, one will be about language. One will be about wellness and medicine, alternative medicine or Asian medicine. And one will be about traditions and rituals. Another one will be about mental health. So let's just give people a taste of what we're interested in exploring. So our first guest, which we've booked, who we've booked is Professor Young Mi Cho, who is a really distinguished professor of linguistics at Rutgers. We wanted to interview a linguist because during the time we've been doing this podcast, we often have so many questions about language as maybe we learned it as kids versus what's being used now, you know. There's been a change since when we were kids to the um, the spelling and romanization of the Korean language. And so um, I think the K's became G's and... Uh, right, there's um, no consistency. So you can isn't. look up five different ways to spell bulgogi. Yes. And spell differently on every website, newspaper. And uh, um, when we interviewed Eric Kim, um, who writes about Korean f- you know, food uh, for the New York Times, he said that he struggled because there were spellings, um, with, you know, like two T's in a row. or um, And uh, I, I thought... All of that was really fascinating. Yeah. There are many questions that I'm excited to ask because growing up in my family, my mother, who was obsessed with learning English as a young woman, and she continues to read a lot, and she's always calling me and asking me um, to parse like the very specific definitions of words and phrases, and often she'll tell me about a Korean word that there is no equivalent in English. And I always think that's so interesting. Like, what are the words she wishes there was a way to say succinctly in English? Absolutely. Um, And I noticed that too. There, you know, one of my favorite phrases or the ways uh, Koreans express um, closeness and intimacy is the um, use of the word uri, like our, and uh, um, our daughter, our son. And uh, that isn't uh, anything that there's an equivalent uh, of in the U.S. And that kind of term of endearment. And and I think a lot of people can take that and read into it this like the collective um, and how uh, Koreans are really uh, or Asians are very community minded, um, less individualistic. I don't know how much of that is, you know, actually is um, is true, but I am curious to ask these questions. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of questions for our linguist. One of the next topics, like a lot of Korean Americans, my dad's a physician. And in my own household, I don't remember a whole lot of Asian medicine. I think because my my family was very interested in assimilating, you know, Western medicine, rah, rah. Then when I really thought about it, I do remember... For instance, my mom had really bad rheumatoid arthritis, and she did go have some herbal teas made by someone, uh, I think a Chinese doctor. Hanyak. Yeah, she mm-hmm. had hanyak. She had she was drinking tea made from the antlers of a deer yes. and how yes. terrible it smelled. And I remember her at the time telling me that she knew it would not work, but she was desperate and she and she was going to try it. So did it work for her at all? It didn't work, as I recall, you mm-hmm. know. And um, since then, she's had traditional medicine, which has really helped in injections. But recently, I chatted with her about it, and she remembers it working 
wonderfully. And it's really interesting. <laughs> like now, <laughs> she thought it was history. the greatest. My parents were, you know, self, they were small business owners. They had a beauty supply store in downtown Newark. They didn't really speak English uh, very well. Um, they only really hung out with other Korean people at Korean church. And we only spoke Korean at home and we only ate Korean food at home. And I think because of that, I had a much more Korean traditional upbringing without Definitely. as much assimilation. And we had a ton. I, my mom always said my dad was like kind of a country bumpkin and his family were like less sophisticated. So that meant that we had a lot of, um, you know, belief in like traditional superstitious uh, remedies. We did the whole like da you know, where if we had a, a, an upset stomach, my you know parents would do this, where they would take all the blood from my shoulder and arm and then, you know, wind a piece of thread around my thumb and then they would like prick it and magically it would feel better, you know. Um, my parents were always brewing something on the stove that smelled up the house. We had to drink it. But we also did things like, you know, deer antlers. We live in the country. And so they would like try to go hunting deer in our woods. And that also meant that if there was a, you know, fresh roadkill on the side of the road, they would pack it up oh in God. their trunk and bring it home. And uh, we did all sorts of like weird remedies and things like that. So they would take the antlers off a deer, yeah, because then you remember like, them it was like sawing forage. that thing off, yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's like really good potent fresh not, deer antler. Yeah. Because not only that, hey. my parents would like totally be so embarrassed if I said this, but they actually believe that if you drank the blood of a deer, that you would uh, and eat the liver, you would get so much iron, it would really bolster your strength. And uh, um, they used to make us drink deer blood. Holy from shit. these roadkill animals. So, okay. I mean, I'm learning like a, lot a, a total about, different yeah. you know, upbringing from yeah. like your Yeah, no, my great dad was just, childhood. I think my dad was still so excited about antibiotics. He was <laughs> like, he was like, he carried around antibiotics wherever we went, like on a ski trip. He, if, and if one of us were feeling ill or had a cut, he'd like whip out some tube or some pills and just start administering them. So we were hoping to inter interview um, an acupuncturist and maybe an herbalist. One of our other topics about traditions and rituals, we've been thinking about um, the way that Korean Americans have been celebrating weddings, funerals, chuseok, and in a way that maybe they did it more privately in the past, maybe now with more acceptance of and celebration of Asian traditions in general and explosion of social media, people are really like doing it up. Like when you have your child's first birthday, you can rent these elaborate displays, mm -hmm. like things mm -hmm. that I don't think you could do to that extent when we when we had our own kids. Well, yeah. I mean, that, really, and that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. I mean, there have always been places where you could rent the, you know, the plastic fruit in a stack. Um so that you didn't have to cut up fruit all the time and the elaborate, you know, kaja, you know, those stacks. Because um, I remember my mom rented those plastic ones for my son's toll. Mm. And uh, uh, we just put it on a coffee table in front of the sofa in my living room and did some wonky pictures. Um, but by the time my cousin, who you know grew up in Queens, um, had his first kid, he's about 15 years younger than me, it's become incredibly fast fashionable to have these um, almost like bar mitzvah, bar mm -hmm. mitzvah style tolls. And people are inviting their friends from work. Mm -hmm. It's not just their Korean yeah. relatives. Yeah. I think that's all really fascinating. There was an article recently by Eileen Kwan, and she wrote an article in the New York Times about how millennials and young people are redefining traditions for themselves. And 
It's exactly what we have been thinking about. I've practiced Cheza, which is the, um, you know, ancestor, um, paying respect to your ancestors with my parents who are very, very religious. So we would go to my grandparents' grave. We would do the kunchar. We would do, you know, these funerary prayers. And we, you know, like I had to wear like black or dark colors for three years after my grandma died. And then when I left my parents' home and, you know, I'm a college student and now I'm an adult, I, I kind of always just followed ar- along their traditions. And if they didn't call me to come and, oh, we're doing this, I just never did it. But now that I'm a parent and I'm an adult, I realize that I can actually carry on those traditions myself. You know, and to be honest, I don't want to replicate exactly what my parents did because that's their traditions for them, and even though it may be more authentic, I just want it to be like more authentic to me, so that I don't feel like I'm parroting something that I that doesn't feel right. So you know, this year I did my first cheza at home. Um, it was just for me, but you know, it had pictures of all my family members who had passed for the past two generations. And what did your kids think of that when they saw? The little shrine that you made. Emmett looked at it and he thought, Emmett is my 16-year-old. And I put it like in the living room on top of the credenza where it was like on display, like in the middle of the room. And he thought it was really nice. I left it up there for like a week and a half. And it's actually still up there. Nice, like pretty bouquet of flowers. And um, it's almost like they're in your eyesight line of vision every time you go to the kitchen and you think about them, Mm -hmm. you know, even if you don't consciously think about them, you look at them. And he thought it was a really great way to honor your ancestors because I had to, I had to explain to him why I did it and what it was for. And, um, and he loved it. Yeah. Well, this leads us to talking a little bit about what I think is super cool which is your funerary projects project. So um, I should explain that Juliana, who's, of course, a photographer, one of the projects that she's been working on for maybe over the past 10 years um, has been taking portraits that Koreans prepare to be shown at their funeral before Mm -hmm. they die. Mm -hmm. It's something that can be seen as sort of morbid, but for a lot of Koreans, because they've grown up with this tradition They don't see it as morbid, more uh, just a way of preparing, knowing eventually you're going to have a funeral and being prepared and um, having a portrait taken the way that you'd like to be remembered by your family. So Juliana, years ago, did a series of these portraits. Um, Many of them were of her family members, but also seniors she met at a senior citizen center? At a senior center at my parents' church and community centers. So I would offer uh, the services for free. Um, And I was following a format that pre-existed me um, because my parents' church, they would have a parishioner who was an amateur photographer who would set up. And if you look at the Korean newspapers, there are lots of people who do this where they go to a center in Korea somewhere or a park and somebody uh, well-meaning sets up a little photo booth and they take portraits of the seniors. Right. It can be feel a little bit like peremptory kind of churning through of people and just taking these pictures. So what Juliana was doing was spending time getting to know the subjects of her portraits and giving them time to to relax and express, you know, how they want to be remembered and maybe talk about why they chose to wear what they were wearing. And I think she was able to capture much more personal, lively portraits um, that really express people's personalities. And in more recent years, Juliana has been doing that and exploring even more kind of personalized types of portraits taken in people's own homes. So when I first started taking these um, Yongjong Sajin, when I first started them, I called them funerary portraits because they were used at funerals and at ancestor worship rituals. And uh, that's just what everyone called them. And then, you know, I um, photographed Catherine's mother. Catherine's mom is so bright, curious. And, you know, one of the first things she said to me is, 
You know, this Yongjeon Sajin, funerary, funerary, it's not the literal translation. I'm trying to think back to the root of this word and what it really means. And I was so excited because I had actually tried to Google it and done some research on my own and hadn't gotten very far. So with Catherine's mom's help, she said that the actual root and the meaning of Yongjeon means like veneration, commemorative. This is such a nicer way to refer to Yes. these portraits. Yes. Because funerary portraits sounds completely depressing well, and, and it's also, forbidding. Yeah, and, it's yeah. also single function because yeah. it's just for the funeral. And that is you know, an important event for sure. But these pictures get pulled out for the ancestor worship um, and they live on during, you know, for every Chesha. So if anything, it is, they are legacy portraits. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've been calling them. Right. Somebody who steps into a tradition, I want to, you know, help preserve that tradition and give my sitter what they want. So I, you know, just adopted the format that was out there. And I've kind of come to realize that, you know, I don't know how pleased or happy they are with the, that format you know, where they're rushed in, they've got you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get their picture done, and then they're rushed out. And it certainly isn't the way that I conduct any of my other portrait sessions. And, you know, after many years, I got a little brave to think that I think I'm going to step in and shake it up. I think I'm going to have to impose the way I work on these pictures so that I can have a perspective and direct them because I think they're going to be happier with those with those pictures. And uh, I scheduled an appointment with Catherine's parents and uh, Catherine's dad definitely wanted the white background and just more traditional. Uh, mm-hmm, and he wore a suit and Catherine's mom was a lot more playful and we did different variations where we had the silk screen that she had gotten when she was married, and we used that as a background. We had one that was a cleaner background. We had, you know, flowers, and she, you know, tried a humbuck and her favorite dress, you know, hair up, hair down. Yeah, you know, and she, she loved it. And I think what um, really struck me was, and Juliana sensitive to this fact that when you become someone in your 80s, you know, men or women, but particularly women, um, they have a loss of this um, sense of self-care, attention to beauty, having people look at you. And so my mom really appreciated this opportunity for somebody to come and help her with her hair and help her with her makeup and, you know, fuss over her a little bit because she hadn't had that in a long time. And I think for all these older people that you're working with, it's um, it's a really memorable portrait session. I think that is so enriching and meaningful for me as well. And I think that's what was missing when I did the sign up sheet and I was trying to photograph 20 people in a day where they may get the actual picture that they need. But, you know, for me, the whole process really means more to me than the final picture. The final picture is a document of the process and the experience. And it, I really appreciate the time I was able to spend with your mom, that she got so much out of it and that it's, um, the portrait of her is a reflection of how she felt, um, being seen and, uh, you know, talking about her life and her earliest childhood memories. And I think you can see all those things in her face. And those are the kinds of um, portraits that, you know, I I would like to do more of going forward with the Legacy Project. Absolutely. Should we talk a little bit about the mental health episode we want to do? So I think last year I was writing a personal essay for Real Simple Magazine. And at one point I was interviewing some therapists And I'd heard about this book written by a Chinese-American therapist called Permission to Come Home. It's about 
Asian American mental health. And I was so moved by it because she really makes a case for finding an Asian American therapist, if you're an Asian American, and how helpful that can be, because you don't have to explain these basic concepts that shared by so many Asian American families, like parental expectation, scholastic pressure, immigrant um, struggles. Feel your piety. There's nothing <laughs> new about this, yet I think um, when you try to talk to even a very sympathetic, maybe Caucasian therapist, they might spend half a session explaining to you, oh, don't worry about what other people think, or don't worry about your parents, think about yourself, you know, when it's maybe impossible mm -hmm. if you've Mm -hmm. If you've been raised with certain ethos to discard all that. It was so interesting to me to finally talk to someone about this. And it can be hard to find an Asian American therapist or a Korean American therapist. It can be really hard for an older Asian person who might not have such good English mm -hmm. to find a Korean speaking yeah, therapist. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of social stigma still Absolutely. in Asian American communities. Oh, you just got to suck it up. Don't complain. You think you've got it hard. There's so many, you know, yeah, think yeah. about all the other people and how hard it was for your grandfather to come here, you know. I mean, can you think of a generation that needs therapy more than <laughs> the Korean American, you know, uh, who immigrated here. My mom is just wonderful, but as a woman who married into a family of four men and she married the oldest son, um, I mean, she talks about how she was treated as like a servant for I don't know how many years of her life and, you know, all her life was, was just you know, cleaning, caring, doing all the work. And uh, um, I still think that, you know, even though she suffered a lot of trauma from the war, um, moving to a new country, some of the, the worst trauma that she still deals with is how she feels that she was mistreated by her in-laws and how as a woman that she didn't feel like she had any value even though she was contributing so much. And it's like a, a song she sings every day. And I I really think that um, if she had some therapy and in a willing year that somebody who could help her work through this, that it would just make her so much of a happier person. And You mean uh, you, if she had had therapy during the hard time? No, or now just now even. just to get I want over her to what get, happened in the past? Yeah, get therapy now. Um, so finding a, um, a Korean-speaking therapist who has uh, an understanding of trauma and generational trauma, I think would be so beneficial for her. Right. I, and isn't, um, I think we did talk to Jason Kim about mm -hmm. therapy, mm -hmm. and he talked about how he really searched high and low to find a Korean Korean American therapist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when he did, it made the world of difference. Yeah. And yeah. I can see that, you know, lots to discuss there. I often think about how our kids, when they were younger, they used to look a lot alike because they looked, as I always thought, they looked half. You know, they look like halfies. They're hapa, which is a, a word that I learned, you know, maybe only when I was like 20 years yeah. old. Emmett and Leo with their cheeks. Yeah. But then um, more recently, I've learned that we really shouldn't be using that terminology, half, because it implies a lesser than. So The term is? The term is biracial. So we're both raising, raising biracial Korean American children. And in my case, Korean English children. Exactly, exactly. So I've had to kind of almost change my thinking. It could be considered insulting for some. Oh, there are so many things so that we grew up call, with. How do your kids think of themselves? You know, I remember just like maybe two years ago, um, Emmett was learning about Marxism and all the isms, you know, feminism. And um, and he came home one day and he said to me, Mom, there's so much injustice in this world. And I, I just feel so guilty. Um, I have so many unearned advantages as a white male. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, excuse me? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Emmett, do you see yourself as white? And he said, 
I look white, and he's actually maybe looks more white than he does Asian. Um, my older son probably looks slightly more Asian than mm-hmm. white. And I thought it was interesting that for him, the identity was this is how other people perceive me because mm-hmm. this is how I present. Um, I present more white on the outside. And so I had to talk to him about, well, you know, you're actually half Asian. I mean, look at your mom. She's standing right in front of you. And uh, um, when you think about it, you know, a lot of the time we spend, um, because his, you know, dad's side of the family all live in England, um, we don't get to see them very frequently, whereas we're always spending time with my parents, his grandparents. I said, you know, all the traditions that we have and everything, I said, in my mind, I yeah. think you're growing I'm up a lot more he Asian. considered himself more white because you were raising him, I think, with a lot of Korean traditions, more than my kids. Yeah. Well, I think it's high school is still quite young. But, you know, my kids are – it's been interesting to witness um, their growth because they go to a high school, which is kindergarten through 12. And, you know, from kindergarten to sixth grade – Asians are maybe about 17% of the population, um, predominantly white. And then starting from 7th grade to 12th grade, they let in students from all over New York City, not just Manhattan. And uh, that ratio becomes 55% Asian. What's really curious for me is that my kids ended up thriving more in the high school than in the elementary. They gravitated towards the Asian kids for friends. And um, now that my older son is in college, most of his friends are Asian. And he just sent me a picture um, on the 8th, so it was two days ago, and he went to a Korean uh, American like students association <laughs> meeting, <laughs> and I was like, "Holy cow!" <laughs> I had never asked him to do anything like that, or mm-hmm. I didn't even know that there was something like that on his campus. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm sitting there like, "Oh my gosh, why are you there?" <laughs> you know, I said, "Who'd you go with?" Because most of his friends are um, Chinese. And uh, he said, I went with these two people that I'd never heard of and like all these like non-Korean people. And I said, did you guys go for the food? And yeah. He said, yes, I have kimbap here. Yeah, he brought non-Koreans, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like white guys to the party. Uh, so you never know what's going to happen with um, their identity, you know, and how they see themselves. But it's, you know, it's almost like fascinating for me to watch like I, – I, like, I don't have that much control over them mm-hmm. because they are their own individuals. Right. I don't know if you see that with your kids. Well, I would say with my son, he I think likes to identify with the white side a little bit more. I would I I feel like that's probably the accurate way to put it, which is a little disappointing to me, but I understand, you know, in my town, it's pretty white. Mm-hmm. He is resistant to a lot of my attempts to push him in what's known like an Asian direction. Oh, um, what is an Asian direction? Well, you like know, it's the playing, playing of the classical music, <laughs> which he barely is still doing, but he's still playing the cello. This year he took up wrestling, which I was firmly against, and his father too, but he really wanted to do it. And I think, God, that is a white boy sport, wrestling. I cringe. I don't know. Every, it's not as white it. as like sailing or, you know. Yeah, I I guess. You know, of course, I love him to be a little bit more Korean in spirit, and he has time. He does love Korean food, and I have to say that um, I find very touching and reassuring. And in the morning, what he'd rather eat anything else is is some hot rice with some warm stuff labeled Mm -hmm. over it, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, he has a, he likes kimchi. He loves Korean food, and I have to hold on to that. My daughter, um... I think she's interested in her Asian side very much. She's much more open to it. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, Is that a recent thing or she's always been? She's always been that way, mm-hmm. you know. And I, and I share a lot with her. I feel in many ways that I myself am half Korean, which is weird because I'm by blood 100% Korean. But because I was raised speaking English, my, my family um, really 
had the idea that my brother and I should be as assimilated as possible. My mom made such a heroic effort to try to learn recipes from the neighbors and cook, you know, that 70s, 80s cuisine that people were cooking with Campbell's soup. You know, she gave it a good try. So we had a fair amount of Western food that she cooked, along with Korean food, of course. So in many ways, I feel like I'm half myself. So it's kind of this interesting thing going on where I've only become more interested in my Koreanness in recent years, a lot of it through this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I have come to like Asian American studies lately, like very lately. I just kind of always took my Koreanness for granted. You know, I think I've said this before. It's the least interesting part of me or, you know, I just wear it. I can't wash it off. It's there, you know. I'm just really learning to understand that we have a rich history as Asians in this country and that that we're kind of shaping that history now as we speak. And right now with, you know, a lot of AAPI uh, initiatives going on, a lot of the focus on the violence against the AAPI uh, community during COVID. I think like we're in the midst of this shift and shaking up and change and I can feel it and I don't know where it's it's headed, but I can see that there's different things popping up. It's like rapid growth and change right mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. And we're definitely just right in the middle of it. Yeah. My mom is like incredibly diligent with her medical issues and you know she's always walking and she's always doing everything that's necessary and she gets so upset with my dad for not keeping his diet, not exercising and she gripes and then they get into fights and then you know I'm the um, the empathetic daughter so I always hear all of it and there have been many times when I said to her you should just get a divorce mom why didn't you get a divorce back then it's not too late (laughs) do you mean it you know one of the reasons why I say this is because she was terrible when I told her I was getting divorced from Phil you know how many years ago was that that was oh my gosh it must be like six to seven years ago and she was just like you know like she thought the prayers and her meddling was going to fix it all and at one point we were in a car ride it was just the two of us and she just kept nagging at me and I said to her listen do you love me or do you love your reputation more What is it? You're worried about what your church friends are going to say? I said, do you want me to be happy? Or do you care more what your friends at church think? I said, because you have not had a very happy marriage. Do you want unhappiness for your daughter so you can save face at church? What kind of life do you want for me going forward? Is that why you keep asking me to stop getting divorced? How many times have I had to tell you we've tried? You may not have known about it, but we have tried. And uh, after that, she called me up and she said, I love you and I want you to be happy. And she has not been, she's not nagged me about the divorce once since then. She still says, I wish you could still stay married. Why can't you do, do, uh, stay the way you are now? Because, you know, I, I've taken like the whole Gwyneth Paltrow, (laughs) Demi Moore approach to divorce where you consciously, you know, dismantled the marriage, but we've kept the family intact. And uh, um, I think even my ex was really worried about this because he, you know, left his family in England and my family really embraced him. And uh, I just couldn't imagine saying you can't come to Christmas, you know, you can't come to New Year's. And I couldn't imagine even like asking my kids to not spend a holiday with them. And so, you know, my ex has been a part of every single family holiday, every single birthday celebration, every single like vacation, um, Christmas, New Year. And It's made my mom really happy because she has not told any of my aunts and uncles 
or my oh, anyone know. at church. All right, nobody tell Juliana's <laughs> relatives about this episode. My mom even says, "Okay, he's showing up for the family lunch. Great, because nobody knows that you're divorced, well, you know, and nobody needs to tell them." I kind of think it's true. Why? Because sh- this way, she stopped nagging you. She herself is more at peace with it. But if it lets things be easier with the rest of the family, let them be happy, right? I think so too. Think it's but fine. it's it's this whole um, double bind that the Korean community is in. They're so incredibly restrictive, but like nobody can really adhere to that rigidity. You know, rigidity, and uh, and so everybody finds a way around it. Everyone's kind of like sneaking around and you know, like lying to their family members. Um, and, and again, I'm thinking about Daniel K. Isaac and his mom and his mom not having told her church friends that he's gay and saying, can you drop me off at the corner of the church so they don't see you, you know? Um, Yet they all know. I'm sure So they I think your relatives know as now. well. All it takes is one of them to tell the others, and they're t- and they're acting as if they don't know to give your mother that peace. I think they don't they, know. Okay. We because won't, we won't tell them. Because who's gonna tell them? You know, I mean, I'm not gonna go up to them and say, "Do you know I'm divorced?" <laughs> and my ex shows up at every family function, you know, and we still do family portraits together. And you know, I, I think the way divorce is generally done in um, culture is not something that I believe in, which is like it splits apart. You know, half mm-hmm. again. Yeah. You know, this half and that half. We split apart the holidays. We split apart, you know, weekends. That kind of thing. Like we don't have anything written down on paper. And the kids are happy. We're happy. I mean, we have game night and play boggle all the time. And we have a very amicable and very like high functioning family. And um, I don't think that is necessary. Lee, Korean or American. I just think that, you know, it's important to make things work for you and your family. Yeah, fortunately you could. I think for some people that's untenable. Yeah, I, I would say it wasn't always super easy, but it's definitely worth it in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you comfortable talking about your dad? Oh, my dad's health. Yeah. Well, um, your mom is taking care of him. Yeah. Well, um, my dad just turned 87 and similar to your dad, uh, has not been very diligent about his own health, about doing the exercises he's supposed to do, walking, you know. What are his ailments? Wow. He had a lot of medical issues in the last year. He was hospitalized a few times. He had a kidney infection. He had a stroke. He has a heart condition, underlying heart condition. Um, And at this point, I think it's just age, you know? Mm -hmm. So (laughs) uh, at one point, my mom said to me, Kathy, is the portrait ready? Is it framed? (laughs) Because Juliana had taken this portrait uh, months ago, and I had it nicely in this um, cardboard mailer. And I said, yeah, mom, I have it. She's like, get it framed ASAP. I feel like your dad could die at any moment. And it filled me with terror. And it's just true because he was so in and out of the hospital. He was so frail. And she was watching his every move. Um, And some days he'd seem really out of it. She's like, I have this sense. You better get it framed. So, of course, immediately um, I ordered a frame online. I felt very reluctant to be doing this. Oh, now I'm really literally preparing for his death by putting it in the yeah, frame. So yeah. I rushed it. And I hastily ripped the photograph that Juliana had printed for me, this big, beautiful, oversized portrait. I ripped it in a, such a way that it just was too obvious. It wasn't on his face, but I had ripped it. So I couldn't even tell my mom. I called Juliana probably at 7 in the morning and said, Juliana, this could be, this could all be fine. But in case my dad happens to pass, you know, I need this. Can you please reprint this portrait? She reprinted it. And he's been fine. That's months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Also hard. laughs> Thank goodness. It was a lot of alarm for nothing. But yes, so that's. 
our connection. <laughs> well, I think that um, every time I get together with my friends, um, you know, I'm in my early 50s. If they are lucky enough to still have a parent or both parents still living, um, all we talk about is their health. And there is like a, a sense of urgency when I hear about their situation where I think, do you have a, p- a portrait to sign? <laughs> 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 and I have this urgency of like, you know, you you got to do it. You got to get it, you know, call me in before um, it's too late. Not only their legacy portrait, but um, I really believe that the big multi-generational family portrait is um, a way to have an event or an experience where everyone's together. And then to look at that picture, think about that day and that time, and that it actually helps people with the grieving and healing process once their, you know, their loved one passes. So I really encourage everyone to document your family gatherings for, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or Sunday dinner or, you know, whatever it is, I think it just helps with the grieving. And, you know, in if you ever read Marie Kondo, um, she says the easiest things to let go are the clothes and then like, you know, your books and that the hardest things to let go of because they have so much um, meaning attached to them are the photos and letters. It's yeah. true. So um, for my dad's birthday, my brother and I finally got our act together and instead of just having a meal in the end, we spent a really lovely day. First of all, we got in the car and he hasn't really left Westchester in the past few years. You know, it's hard for him to get around and he doesn't have the energy. We took him to Bayside to his favorite Korean Chinese restaurant, which we had gone to when we were kids. It's Korean style Chinese food, which is its own cuisine. It's judging men, but there are also all these other dishes that I consider weird. I never came to love. What are some? Tang yeah, which Jampong. is right, like a <laughs> the greatest hits, <laughs> <laughs> like a very, very very fried pork with the yeah, sweet yeah. orange, yeah, sweet yeah. and sour orange sauce, sticky sauce on top. A lot of like abalone and um, oh, you splashed out for the good stuff. Yeah, so so we went to his favorite restaurant, which I remember as a kid. I thought it was disgusting and strange. This time around, I liked it a little bit more. But my kids had the same reaction, like, "What the hell is this food? This is not." Chinese, this is not Korean, this is like a weird situation. We went there and then we drove around our old neighborhood in Great Neck where we grew up. We went to visit the outside of our two old houses mm-hmm. that I remember growing up in. It really made me appreciate how um, my dad, you know, came to America and he figured out a way to give us mm-hmm. a great childhood. Mm-hmm. I think the education and the public schools I got were better than the ones my own kids are getting. I really appreciate what he did. And so that was great. We went. And then, the best of all, we went back to my brother's house. where My brother had prepared a slideshow of the actual slides that we had looked at when we were kids. He had fixed up the old slide projector that he had to get extra parts for on eBay. He fixed up the carousel and we watched a slideshow of when we were little. And that was that is amazing. amazing. And what even our kids were fascinated because the technology was something they'd never seen before. The pictures had a warmth, you know, when you look at them through the slide projector. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's great looking at pictures of your parents when oh, they were young. The Hong you family remember, historical tour. Yeah. And you remember, oh, mom, I remember that scarf you used to wear. And it all comes back. And uh, it, it was lovely. The power of images. Yeah. Family pictures. Mm-hmm. How about your mom? You know, she is a great example to me for someone who loves literature, is still always trying to, to learn that more language, more expressions. Um, she'll be reading Shakespeare. She'll be reading the New York Times book review. She'll be s- sending screenshots and asking me, what does this mean? You know, she's inspiring to me. She pushes me because if she can learn English and mm-hmm. speak fluently, mm-hmm. I never even got my mind around 
conversational Korean and she's still pushing herself to learn and express herself. Like there's nothing more inspiring than that. I mean, I think your mom is pretty unique and amazing. I remember when we went over there to do their legacy portraits, she had this two inch thick volume like the complete works of Montaigne or something on the table Montaigne, yeah and I thought oh my gosh I think my I don't think my parents read at all they watch a lot of you know tv um my mom loves the singing variety shows where they have kids coming out and you know they get scored and um so it's a it's a really different kind of like relationship and the conversations that you have with your mom. And uh, um, it was really nice to actually have those kinds of conversations with her about um, root words and the meanings in history and how they could have been shaped. It was, uh, I mean, I think she's like a, a an incredible resource with a lot of stories. Oh, she'll be pleased to hear that. So... I actually am using my mom as a resource because when I told her we were interviewing this linguist, she mm-hmm. had um, a lot of ideas for us. Oh, I bet. So um, I'm really looking forward to our first interview of the new K-pop season. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our next interview in a couple of weeks in New Jersey. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the culture season of K-pop. <laughs> 